Good evening, Highland Park. Hope this finds you having a fantastic evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our Wednesday night Bible study again. I would urge you before I pray just to please make sure you use that prayer list that Amy sends out so faithfully every week to lift up our brothers and sisters in prayer, to um, share in their burdens, help them carry them, and to share in their praises uh, as they celebrate what God is doing in and through them. We will be in Joshua 7 tonight. If you want to turn there, I am going to pray for us, and then I will kick us off, and we will get started. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just, we thank you for this opportunity to be here, Father. We thank you for your presence, Father. We thank you for saving us, for the grace that you have so freely poured into our life. Father, I thank you for convicting me of my sin that was deep within me, Father, revealing that to me and, and letting me understand the wrath that would befall me if I had not repented by your grace and mercy and turn to Christ as my Lord and Savior. And Father, we cry out to you tonight as we study your word to send the Holy Spirit to illuminate the scripture for us. Father, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, continue the work that you have started in us and that you are so faithful to do. Father, let your word speak to us in a manner that is sharp, um, that cuts us and that conforms us into who you created us to be. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. All right, if you would, just uh, follow along with me. I'm going to read chapter 7 in its entirety, and we will get into our study tonight. The Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah took some of what was set apart, and the Lord's anger burned against the Israelites. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Aven, east of Bethel, and told them, Go up and scout the land. So the men went up and scouted Ai. After returning to Joshua, they reported to him, Don't send all the people, but send about 2,000 or 3,000 men to attack Ai. Since the people of Ai are so few, Don't wear out all of our people there. So about 3,000 men went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of them and chased them from outside the city gate to the quarries, striking them down on the descent. As a result, the people lost heart. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down to the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening, as did the elders of Israel. They all put dust on their heads. Oh, Lord God, Joshua said, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan to hand us over to the Amorites for our own destruction? If only we had been content to remain on the other side of the Jordan. What can I say, Lord, now that Israel has turned its back and run from its enemies, when the Canaanites and all who live in the land hear about this, they will surround us and wipe out our name from the earth. Then what will you do about your great name? The Lord then said to Joshua, Stand up. Why have you fallen face down? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant that I appointed for them. They have taken some of what was set apart. They have stolen, deceived, and put those things with their own belongings. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They will turn their backs and run from their enemies because they have been set apart for destruction. I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart. Go and consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate themselves, for tomorrow is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are things that are set apart among you, Israel. You will not be able to stand against your enemies until you remove what is set apart. In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe the Lord selects is to come forward clan by clan. The clan the Lord selects is to come forward family by family. The family the Lord selects is to come forward man by man. The one who is caught with a thing set apart must be burned along with everything he has because he has violated the Lord's covenant and committed an outrage in Israel. Joshua got up early the next morning. He had Israel come forward tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was selected. He had the clans of Judah come forward 
and the Zarahite clan was selected. He had the Zarahite clan come forward by heads of families, and Zabdi was selected. He then had Zabdi's family come forward man by man, as, and Achan, son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was selected. So Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and make a confession to him. I urge you, tell me what you have done. Don't hide anything from me. Achan replied to Joshua, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I did. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful cloak from Babylon, five pounds of silver and a bar of gold weighing a pound and a quarter, I coveted them and took them. You can see for yourself, they are concealed in the ground inside my tent with the silver under the cloak. So Joshua sent messengers who ran to the tent, and there was the cloak concealed in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from inside the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites, and spread them out in the Lord's presence. Then Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the cloak, and the bar of gold, his sons and daughters, his ox, donkey, and sheep, his tent and all that he had and brought them to the valley of Achar. Joshua said, Why have you brought us this trouble? Today the Lord will bring you trouble. So all Israel stoned them to death. They burned their bodies and threw stones on them and raised over him a large pile of rocks that remains still today. Then the Lord turned his, from his burning anger. Therefore, that place is called the Valley of Achar still today. It's a lengthy text uh, that we have tonight to walk through, uh, but I think it'll be very beneficial for us. You know, as we start this off, I have witnessed many times in life and in sporting events where things just seem to be going along swimmingly, where in life absolutely uh, nothing is wrong, things are perfect, it couldn't be any better if you tried, and then just out of the blue, everything seems to go wrong. Every step you take just seems to crumble and fall. I have watched sports teams be up by insurmountable amount of points, thinking that they can just cruise to the finish line and not have to worry about it. When out of the blue, the opposing team, things just start happening and the wheels just seem to fall off the winning team. And the opposing team quickly scores in a series of events that just seems highly unlikely and impossible. That's why, and that's exactly what we find here in Joshua 7. That's why I've aptly named tonight's study, Snatching Defeat from the Jaws of Victory. You know, we ended last week's study in chapter 6 on such a high note. There was so much joy to be found. The walls had collapsed in because God had pressed down on them and destroyed them. Um, the enemy was defeated as each man went in straight ahead, and Rahab and her entire family were saved and pulled out. Um, and it was all in accordance with the promise that God had made to Joshua. But I told you last week, um, as we were in the lesson and toward the end, despite the seemingly peak of Israel, God had just parted the Jordan River. Um, he had just called the walls of Jericho to fall. Everything was going right, that it wouldn't take long for the walls to come crashing down. And here we are in chapter 7. That's when the walls cave in. And, you know, we get a sense of just how bad this is in chapter 7 as we make that transition from chapter 7 to chapter 6. Notice what the last verse in chapter 6 says. It says, And the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Because of what God was doing in Joshua, his flame spread throughout the entire land. But chapter 7 says, The Israelites, however, were unfaithful regarding the things set apart for destruction. This very first verse that we read in chapter 7 as we start this study tonight um, sets up the situation that we have that the entirety of the rest of the chapter goes on to explain in complete detail. The walls of Jericho fell because of God as we studied last week. He gave the city to his people, to Israel. He handed it to them. As I said last week, there was no battle that they fought. Israel didn't have to overcome Jericho by battle. But even while there was no battle there, there was another battle that was brewing. 
as they were inside Jericho. And it was a battle that was brewing inside the hearts of the Israelites. And it's a battle that still brews in our hearts today. And it's a battle to be persistent. Each man, woman, every child of God, to be persistent in our hearts and trusting God in his promises. It's a battle to remain detailed in observing all his instructions that he has laid out for us. It's a battle inside our hearts to have complete obedience to everything that our Lord tells us we need to do. And as we just read, that's the battle that Achan lost that caused him to crash and burn intensely. You know, the army stayed in file as they marched around. There wasn't a sound that came out of the men's mouths until the appointed time that they were told to speak. The trumpets blowed consistently. They were detail-oriented on staying focused on the God's commands, everything that he gave them. And when God pushed the walls down, the men went straight in. Then they were obedient. They pulled Rahab out. But it was at the moment that God gave that victory to Israel that Achan lost his internal battle battle that he had. And what's worse, the entire nation of Israel, we find, is implicated in the breach of faith. And the entire nation of Israel feels God's wrath that it has poured out upon them. And we find out what happens right here at the beginning of chapter 7 so we can make sense, spiritual sense, out of the rest of the entirety of the story. But notice, Joshua doesn't find out until halfway through this story exactly what's going on, just like the nation. And Achan might have even hit a point where he's thinking that he got away with something because nothing has come to pass. And the situation that happens here isn't new. This is something that's happened in Israel's history repeatedly, be it a short history. God's judgment has already fallen on those in Israel who have been disobedient and rebelled and that they willfully break his covenant. Go with me back to Numbers 16.30, and we read about Korah's rebellion, where Korah got a group of individuals together. They wanted to stand up, and they wanted to lead as well. But Moses stands up in Numbers 16 and 30. He says, but if the Lord brings about something unprecedented, and the ground opens its mouth and swallows them along with all that belongs to them, so that they go down alive to Sheol, then ye will know that these men have despised the Lord. And, and we read later that just as he finished his speaking, the ground does indeed open up its mouth, and Korah and all of the people that were with him that raised up the rebellion that were disobedient to God were just pulled down into the earth. You can go forward to Numbers 21, uh, 4 through 9, and you can read where they were... They had God's wrath poured out on them because of their impatience, because of their unfaithfulness. Listen to Numbers 21, 4 through 9. It says this. It says, Then they set out from Mount Or by way of a Red Sea to bypass the land of Edom. But the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses. This is a familiar one for us. It says, Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There is no bread or water, and we detest this wretched food. And then in verse 6, it says, For then the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit them so that many Israelites died. So because of grumbling, because of unpatience, because of ungratefulness, God's wrath was again poured out upon his people. And then you can go on and you can read Numbers 25, where God again pours his wrath out upon the people of a plague. Over 24,000 died because of sexual relations that they were forbid to have with the people of Moab because their people will bow down to their gods. They're not to give their sons or daughters in marriage, and they did exactly just that. So already in just three instances I've showed you, God has poured out his wrath on the nation of Israel. And here's my point. You see, God doesn't have a set of standards for the Canaanites and then another set of standards for his people, for Israel. If Canaanites, if the land of Canaan and all the Canaanites are to be judged for the sin they had and they're to be destroyed by God's righteous wrath that happened in the city of Jericho, then so will Israel if she adopts the same kind of disloyalty towards God. So if Achan in here, as the scripture tells us, decides to align himself with things that are devoted to destruction, as the scripture says, and he did so by taking what belongs to God, then destruction is going to fall upon him. And hear me now, being an Israelite, 
is not going to be any defense as he stands before God. In fact, I think it's quite the opposite, and I think it reigns true today. I think covenant privileges only deepen our covenant obligations. I don't think if we sin, we can stand up and say, hey, I'm a child of God. That should help me. I think that's only going to deepen our obligations that we have because we know. So as we're here, the camp is unclean in God's eyes as he, as he looks at it, and it's unclean due to Achan's disobedience. So God, as he says, is no longer going to go out with battle, into battle with the nation of Israel, at least until the matter is settled. But right here at the end of verse 1, as, as, as we start off before we get into verse 2, no one even is aware of it. No one knows about the issue that's going on. And listen to what it says here in verses 2 through 5. It says, Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and told them, go up and scout the land. So the men went up and scouted Ai. And after returning to Joshua, they reported to him, don't send all the people. The people of Ai are a few, so don't wear out all of our people. So about 3,000 men went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. The men of Ai struck down about 36 of them and chased them out from outside the city gate to the quarry, striking them down on a descent. As a result, the people lost heart. I, I, you look at that after their success at Jericho, and if you're like me, you go, wow. Just about everything that could go wrong went wrong for Israel as they attacked the city of Ai. But we need to understand um, that even though everything seems to be going sideways for the nation of Israel as they go to attack the city of Ai, it's all just a result of the Lord's anger that is burning against them. And we almost here get a glimpse of what Israel would look like without Yahweh, without the Lord, if God was no longer with them. And we find that they look pretty human, pretty ordinary and human, and they look extremely vulnerable. And i got to tell you, we should see parallels between this and what would happen to the church today when God's truth is compromised by humanity's consistent rebellion against him. And here, here's what I mean by that. If the church's message that the churches preach, and I'm not talking about Highland Park in particular, I'm talking about any church anywhere. But if the message that we preach, the gospel message that we preach, is disregarded by the prevailing climate, the culture, um, that is around us, so that the church becomes known for its ineffectiveness and its submission to the enemies of the truth, shouldn't the church desire to find out if it represents a withdrawal of God's presence from among his people because of our compromise and sometimes out, just outright rejection of God's word? I think that bodes something for, for every church everywhere to look into. And we find here, as, as they continue their conquest, that the next city that has to be taken is Ai. Um, and they do what anybody would do. If you're going to go out and you're going to conquer a city, they send out scouts to check out the scouts to access it, to see what needs to be done, to figure out how to attack. But when we get the report here that we just read, the report on Ai seems to have almost an air of nonchalance about it. Right? It, it's, uh, it's not too much to worry about. Yeah, they're smaller. They're a lot smaller than the city of Jericho. They're, they're small in people, so don't wear us out. Let's only send about two or 3,000 people up there to, to take care of it. Let's go a little bit easy on our guys. But we find out in our text that that is more than enough to flip the script on what is going on. And, I, and we don't know what's happening. Maybe they're overconfident because of the battle of Jericho and the victory that they had at Jericho, the seemingly impregnable fortress that was there and how quick and easy it was. I know it had to be easier than they thought it was going to be, and it was all due to the Lord. So this is a smaller city, right? Human logic, yeah, no problem at all. So only 3,000 men get sent up, but 36 Israelites never make it back home. And the rest of them that went up to attack just wind up retreating and falling away. And we find here in the text that the, the first Israelites that we hear about lay dead in the desert. And it seems that defeat is, is right on the doorstep for the nation of Israel. And at this point, Jericho has to seem like it is eons and eons ago. And in the end of verse 5, it tells us, as a result, 
the people lost heart. Now that should be a, a familiar refrain to us as we've studied Joshua and Joshua 2, 11, when the spies went in to uh, search out Jericho, Rahab got the spies and she explains to them that her people had heard about how God had dried up the Red Sea, how they crossed over the Jordan River, how they defeated the Amorite kings. And she says this, when we heard this, we lost heart and everyone's courage failed. You go two more chapters over and, and you find that after the memorial stones were set up, the very first verse in chapter 5 that Brian was so gracious in, in teaching us said that when all the Amorite kings across the Jordan to the west and all the Canaanite kings near the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the water of the Jordan before the Israelites until they crossed over, they lost heart and their courage fell, failed. So now, this time, for the first time, the, the shoe is on the other foot as the Israelites turn to experience that dread that everybody encounters with defeat. And I'll be honest, there isn't a, a child of God that's out there that, that hasn't been there. When our disobedience, when our unfaithfulness to God, when our refusal to be obedient to what he calls to do brings about a lack of confidence in our spiritual lives, then fear creeps into our hearts. And that's where we'll always be as sinful people living among a falling world, removed from God's grace because of unrepentant sin that is in their lives. And at that point, when we're at that point and we have a, a sin in our life that we know about that we don't confess before God, even prayer doesn't help us. As the psalmist has cried, uh, has cried out, if I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord wouldn't have listened. He won't hear us if we have sin that we're aware of that we don't have repentance in our hearts if we don't confess that sin. And the only way for us to, to get through that valley of fear that we're in is for the guilty to cry out for grace and, and just do exactly what we were instructed to do in the Gospels. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And the only way for us to be justified, for God to answer our prayers, is to repent of our sin, turn and throw ourselves on the mercy of God. And we get to verse 6, we find that that's exactly what Joshua does. Um, as things have went sideways, fear has crept into his heart. We find in verses 6 through 9, listen to verse 6, what he does. It says, And then Joshua tore his clothes and fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening, as did the elders of Israel. They all put dust on their heads. You know, we get, we get Instruction here in verses 6 through 9 is how Joshua and the entire elders for the nation of Israel, how they handled this bad news and how they reacted to the awful news that 36 of their men now lay dead and the rest of the troop had to retreat. Their instincts are right as they throw themselves on the ground and humble themselves, but their thinking is just completely scattered at this point. And when they tear their clothes and, and they put dust on their forehead, it's a, it's a sign of remorse. It's a sign of grief. But it's not necessarily a sign of repentance. In fact, as we read the text, we're not even told that Joshua and the elders are aware of exactly what's going on. They, they aren't even aware that repentance is needed at this point. But he knows that there is a problem, that something has gone awry. So Joshua does what we should all do. And it says he fell face down on the ground before the ark of the Lord until evening. But when, but when Joshua speaks in verses 7 through 9, and I want you to listen to this, we get a, a glimpse of just how flawed his thinking is uh, as he cries out. Listen to this and see if it doesn't sound just a tad familiar to you from previous study in the Old Testament. Verse 7 says, O oh Lord God, Joshua said, why did you ever bring these people across the Jordan and hand us over to the Amorites for our destruction? If only we had been content to remain on the other side of the Jordan. What can I say? Lord, now Israel has turned its back and run from its enemies. When the Canaanites and all who live in the land hear about this, they will surround us and wipe our name out from the earth. Then what will you do about your great name? Now, I read that and I can't help but I, I think that Joshua's words are, are reminiscent of things that have happened in Israel's past 
and he, they're reminiscent of exactly what God has heard from Israel in nations past. And the first thing he says is, why did you let this happen? Israel has always asked in times of grief, in times of struggle, why did you let this happen? And keep in mind, we ask the same thing when we encounter these barriers. The second thing that Joshua cries out to him and says, oh, we would have been better off where we were. Why would you ever bring us out? We would have been better off if you would have just left us there. And then he tells us that what can I say now that Israel has turned its back and run from its enemies? We're humiliated. God, now we're humiliated. They, they think we're weak. We're think, they think we're cowards. And the fourth thing is the enemies are going to see this. They're going to uh, use this to build momentum. They come in and destroy us, to, to eradicate us. And the last thing he says is, then what happens to your name, God? What happens to, to your reputation, to all that you're about? You know, th this, this speech, this prayer that, that Joshua has is, is a mixture of grief. It's a mix mixture of anger, or bad temper, and confusion, whatever you want to call it. And, but it also has accusations in it. And it's also, if you understand it and you think about it, it's also humanity's default position. Anytime we get in a point where things don't go our way. When things don't go according to our plans, we ask those same questions. God, why did you ever let this happen? I would have been better off if I would have stayed where I am. What's going to happen to you? Now I'm going to be ruined. But I think we need to understand that, that Joshua's people are the first generation that have to live by the word, the word of God, the Bible. There's no direct revelation for them as there was when Moses was, was with his people that he had given in the past. When God spoke to Joshua in the opening chapter as he was with them, he tells him, no one will be able to stand against you as long as you live. Above all, be strong and courageous. Do you remember when God told Joshua that? Be strong and courageous. Only be very courageous and observe carefully all that is written and that my, that my servant Moses commanded you to do. And oh, how quickly. Joshua forgets. Oh, how quickly we forget God's faithfulness. How quickly Joshua forgot the promises of God. God had promised that he would stand with him the entirety of the time. Oh, how quickly Joshua forgot all the guarantees that God had made. God would never go back on his promises. And these words that come from Joshua are the words that come from someone that's panicking, that that's losing focus, that, that doesn't have their mind correctly aligned. And it started with a, a flawed assessment on the city of AI that was based on be just being nonchalant about what was going on, and it's now morphed and twisted into a flawed view of God's great plan that he has for us. And it's based on what? One minor setback, something that didn't go according to plan. But still, through that all, if you need to hear me now, Joshua was correct to pour it all out to the Lord. Because any time we humble ourselves before the Lord, as Joshua fall face down before the Lord and stay there till evening, there is always a way forward for us. As long as we make sure that we listen to God. You see, sin, we all know, has a, has a way to distort our view of God, it changes our perception, it, it blurs our vision, and it messes with our thinking. And it, sin causes us to think things that we normally would not think that wouldn't be in our process. And any time we face defeat, we realize that we're really not strong enough in and of ourselves, and we imagine that our enemies are stronger, so much stronger that they really are, and so strong that just Maybe even God is not going to be able to get me out of this situation that I'm in right now because I have made a mess about it. And then what a crock of lies. And it's all fed to us straight from the devil. So hear me now through this. Whatever foolish thing uh, we may have done, still go to God. Humble ourselves before God. And you know, we may get it all wrong, just like Joshua as he's crying out to the Lord in his prayer. And it really doesn't matter. Just talk to God anyway. Humble yourselves and pray, and God will begin to put things back together for us. God will begin to reveal the things that, that need to be set right. And that's exactly what God does for Joshua.
In verses 10 through 13, it says, The Lord says to Joshua, Stand up. Why have you fallen face down? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant that I appointed for them. They have taken some of what was set apart. They have stolen, deceived, and put those things with their own belongings. This is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They will turn their backs and run from their enemies because they have been set apart for destruction. I will no longer be with you unless you remove from among you what is set apart. Go and consecrate the people. Tell them to consecrate themselves for tomorrow. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. There are things that are set apart among you, Israel. You will not be able to stand against your enemies until you remove what is set apart. So through this all, through these verses here, verses 10 through 13, God starts it off with a rebuke. He, he doesn't have patience for self-pity at this point because of Joshua's disregard for his faithful promises. God, in essence, says to Joshua, you know, the problem doesn't lie with me, doesn't lie with my covenant faithfulness or the things that you accuse me of. The problem is with Israel, and the problem is with the sin that is in Israel that is going on there. That's what caused God's anger, and it has to be dealt with, and it has to be removed. And until that issue is resolved, there is always going to be an issue between Israel and God. So we get a clear outline here of exactly what's wrong and exactly what needs to be done to fix it. First off, we're told here in verse 11, right at the very beginning, that there is a sin. Israel has sinned, and it's a, it's a covenant transgression. And sin is disobedient. And it, it tells us, details the sin. It says they have taken some of what's set apart. They have stolen, deceived, and they have put those things with their own belongings. All of those, taken, stealing, deceiving. They all destroy trust. They all destroy obedience. And if things are going to be made right between Israel, if things are going to be reconciled between Israel and Yahweh, the problem needs to be discovered. We need to understand what the sin is. And God doesn't just point out the sin. He, God says that the reason that Israel can't stand, and, and God says that sin is the reason that they can't stand against their enemies. He says you will not be able to stand against your enemies because of the sin. And we also... God gives us a reason why it was sin. Don't you find that awesome? I mean, God just doesn't tell you it's sin because I said it was sin. He gives us the reasoning why it was sin. And he said it's sin because they have taken things that were devoted to God, that were devoted to Yahweh, as opposed to offering to the Lord, to the Lord as they were supposed to do when they took Jericho. And because of that, they themselves are now devoted to the destruction that is there. And at the end of verse 12, God says that I will no longer be with you unless you remove what is set apart among you. God says, look, there is a way out. There is a way out all of this, but it involves repentance. And he says, Israel, you need to consecrate yourself. You need to set yourself apart. You need to purify yourself so tomorrow we can remove those things, God says, that are set apart for the Lord. So he says, assemble the nation, purify yourselves so you can appear before the Lord. And the Lord, Yahweh, the God, will deal with the sin that's been destroying this relationship that we have. And then in verse 14 through 21, we get two parts. First, in the first part of it, God gives them instructions on how this sin is to be dealt with in verses 14 through 15. And then we see Joshua's detailed obedience in verses 16 through 21. And he does what we're familiar with, what he did in the last chapter. He rises up early to make sure that he can take care of everything that God has set before him. And God gives him a lengthy process to figure out what the sin is. And just to find the offender, he says, look, we're going to start off with the nation. And once we get the nation there, we're going to go down to a tribe. Once we figure out the tribe that I pick out for you, we're going to go down to a clan. Once we get to the clan, we're going to go down to a family. Once we get to a family, we're going to go down to a man. And we know that the Lord knows the sin. And we don't know that the Lord knows the sin. So why this lengthy process? Why bring the whole nation together? Why bring the whole body of believers, in our terms, together to find out what the sin is? And it's because the whole nation is implicated because of one man's sin. And even though Achan and his family 
eventually wind up bearing the wrath for that one sin, for that punishment. God has the whole nation involved because they're the object of his wrath. The entire process is done in this manner as God lines them all up because there's absolutely no dependence upon human knowledge or wisdom, but it's utterly dependent upon God. Just like the, the fall of Jericho was utterly dependent upon God, so this too is also utterly dependent upon God. And if you read through those verses again, through it all, Achan stays. He doesn't flee. He doesn't see where the path is going. And then in verse 19, Joshua appeals to Achan to confess his sin as opposed to deny it. Confess it. And he does so because public conf confession of this magnitude when it affects the entire body is so important because God's justice is glorified through public confession. But it's also so that the entire nation would know exactly what the sin was and why it is so deserving of the punishment that God is about to unleash upon Achan and his family. The entire nation felt the impact of the sin, right? 36 men will never make it home to be able to hug their wives, their daughters, or their sons again. Countless sons and daughters will never have a father again because of one man's sin. And Achan's response here as he stands up is kind of straightforward. Uh, and he states it factually. If you look at it, he says, it is true. In verse 20, I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. He says, look, my sin's against the Lord. Even though his sin is felt by everybody and has touched everybody in the entire nation of Israel. So he doesn't just say what he does. Understand that. He doesn't just say, yeah, I took these items. Achan defines it as sin. He calls what he did as sin and lays it out. Um, he defines it as sin, and he accepts the consequences for exactly what he did for his actions. And look at verse 21. Listen to this, because this is familiar for us too, especially when we're talking about sin. It says, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful cloak from Babylon, five pounds of silver and a gold bar weighing a pound and a quarter, I coveted them, and I took them. And that should sound familiar to us. Um, it's the same process and the same description of humanity's fall in the Garden of Eden. I saw, I coveted, and I took. Listen to Genesis 3, 6 here. As he starts off, he says, The woman saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to look at that it was desirable. She coveted it for attaining wisdom, so she took. Some of the fruit and ate it, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Verse 7 goes on to say that the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, so they made fig leaves put together so that they would have coverings for themselves. But that's just not the only spot. Our recent study that we did in 1 John chapter 2, uh, verse 15 through 17, listen to what John says to us. He says, do not love the thing... Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of one's possessions is not from the Father, but it's from the world. And the world with its lusts is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. You see, covetousness here is the root of the problem. So we have to ask ourselves an important, important question here. What happens when God's commands, his written biblical commands that we have before us, that we read, that we study, what happens when God's commands say no, but our heart says, oh, I know, but I want that, especially when our desires conflict with God's law? You know, and I, I love, I always have loved how Paul shares his humanity and expresses the same thing about covetousness, and he spells it out for us in Romans. He says, I think it's in Romans 7, 7, then what shall we say? Is the law sin? Absolutely not. Because if it had not had been for the law, I would have not known what it is to covet. He said, I would not have coveted if the law had not said, do not covet. It's what we see and what we desire, brothers and sisters in Christ, that will determine what we do. And if 
that which we desire and which we see is contrary to God's revealed will in the scripture, then Achan's issue will become our issue. Can we, and we need to ask ourselves, can we at that moment, that moment when that desire is burning in us, when we covet something that we know that we should not have, we know that it is contrary to God's revealed will, can we that, at that moment in our life, can we let God be God of our lives? For Achan, the answer was no. It wasn't something that he could do. It was a, a Babylonian robe, some silver, and some gold, and those were the objects of his desire, wealth, prosperity, prestige. And he took them and he buried them in his tent to hide them. And it begs the question for us, what idols are buried deep within us? What have we hidden within our hearts that we don't think that God is aware of? And what do we bow down to and worship in our tent? You know, if it's true, and we've, you've heard this said before, if, if it's true that no one has any less of God than he or she truly desires, then what is it uh, that we think we're still clinging to as a, revi a, re a re rival? I can't get the words out. What are we still clinging to as a re re it's not coming out. Let's just say it. What do we cling to that surplants him? That'll work. As uh, God in our life, where he rules and reigns on the throne. What is it that we cling to that we can't let go of, that won't let him have complete authority in our lives? And any time we think that something else can take God's place, regardless of how, how short a time that we try to justify it in, the net result is always going to be disaster. We find that disaster in the, in the final verses, 22 through 26. And it's the last verses for our lesson tonight. You know, Achan's statement is verified. Men are sent to his tent. They do find the belongings exactly where he said they would be. And the sentence is carried out on Achan and everything that he has. It starts with the thing he has that were set apart to God, the robe, the gold, and the silver. But it goes on to his livestock, goes on to his tent, goes on to his wife, his sons, and his daughters. And as a result of his sin, his disobedience to the details that God has put before him, his family line is removed from the nation of Israel. There is no one left from his family line, and there are stones that are piled on top of his remains. And the stones serve as a constant reminder for the nation of Israel, just like the, the monument they put up in at the camp at Gilgal and in the river is a reminder of God's faithfulness. There's a pile of stones they, that is written in the text that said it's still here today. And it's a reminder for them, for Israel, for the outcome of sin, if they're disobedient to God. And it is only after all of this is completed, after Achan and his entire, entire family are eliminated, uh, that we are told that in the very last verse, then the Lord turned from his burning anger. And it tells us, therefore, that place is still called the Valley of Achor, still today. The final message here is a harsh one. And again, some would say ruthless as we come across them in the book of Joshua. On a human level, it's absolutely terrifying. An entire family was uh, eradicated and destroyed. Husband, wife, children, the entire home. But on the spiritual level, this should really scream at us as a warning. And it should prick our ears and our hearts and waken us up. And this should scream to us, don't ever make God in your image. Don't ever degrade his holiness. Don't ever disobey God's command. And understand, Achan wasn't poor by any means. He had a wife. He had a family. He had a tent. He had everything he needed and livestock to be able to, to take care of himself. But even with all that he had, he was greedy. He desired more, and that greed would prove to be his downfall, and it would lead him, not just him, but his entire family, to death. Yet the same thing can be said for all sin, right? Because the only wage we ever earn from sin is eternal death. And if you read this passage, if we went through this study tonight and you find yourself troubled by Achan's death and the destruction of everything that he had, the fact that his entire family was destroyed, you need to stop. And recall what sin did to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
how it took from him everything that he had to give, that he who knew no sins bore our sins so that we could have life everlasting with Christ. Now, for most of us, this, this Aitken story should end with the gospel. We should drift back um, in time to the cross, and we should see the sinless Son of Man nailed there, not for anything he did, but for crimes that we committed and dying in our place as a substitute so we wouldn't have to suffer God's wrath and we wouldn't have to suffer the destruction that Achan did. Instead, what do we get? We get forgiveness and grace. You see, if it depended upon our actions or what we did, there'd be many piles of stones or as scripture said, there'd be an eternity in hell. And as we close tonight, I want to leave you with this. I want to go to Ephesians 2, 4 and 6. I'd like you to take this away from it. And it says, But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. Woo, that's something to shout about right there, people. He also raised us up with him and seated him at, with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus. That's the grace of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. Freely given to all who would trust in him and obey him and all his commands. But never forget that God is just as ruthless about sin. So this week, I pray, as you always do, you continue to seek his grace um, as you go to him in prayer. You can to continue to ask him to reveal the sin that we have in our lives, to make it manifest to us so we can visibly confess that sin. Maybe we need to confess it to someone in particular that sin has impacted. Maybe we just need to confess it to God because it hasn't impacted anyone and we think you know, that the sin is just ours. And I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would just continue this week to give you the power to continue to fight the good fight. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a great evening, and I hope to see you next Wednesday. Have a blessed night.